tonight on a very special episode of The Breakdown. We're looking back at some of our favorite guests from the past few months. Democracy expert David Farris talks about the slow motion coup happening right here in America. American democracy is not healthy right now. Sarah Kenzior shed some light on Putin and Trump's creepy bromance. A lot of our elected officials just kind of don't want to talk about it. And Michael Cohen goes on the record about his former boss. There's some surprise moments nobody saw coming. Donald never wanted to be president of the United States. And it all starts now on The Breakdown. Welcome to this very special edition of The Breakdown. I'm Tara Setmayer. Every Tuesday and Thursday night, you count on the Rick Wilson and I to break down the latest headlines as the source of truth amongst the crazy. So with the help of some amazing guests, we're speaking truth to power. We're calling out the bad guys and we're punching up. With you, our amazing audience, we are fighting like hell to save our democracy from authoritarianism. And tonight, we want to look back on some of the highlights of our latest shows. There are some hilarious moments and some pretty dire warnings. Some are both dire and hilarious. Remember the epic Michael Cohen interview? He walks around Mar-a-Lago, right, which is sort of um, an insane asylum for incredibly wealthy sycophants that want to sit there and pat the fat ass of Donald <laughs> Trump. We'll get a taste of that later. But first, co-founder of The Lincoln Project, Steve Schmidt, joined the breakdown to discuss why Trump remains a true threat to our democracy even after he left office. The reality is, and I can make the argument that at this hour, despite his loss, he remains the most powerful man in America. And let me tell you why I say that. He's a man without morals or conscience, and he's a man who has the power to kill with a whisper, with a word. Joe Biden won't exercise or abuse that type of power, but Trump will for selfish aims. And so we've already crossed the Rubicon. We should pay attention. When our elected officials tell us around an impeachment vote that we are intimidated and afraid for our lives, wake up not living in a free country anymore. They have opted out of belief and faith in democracy that over a million 200,000 Americans have made blood sacrifices to preserve and protect over the course of our history. And they're doing it for a decrepit, delusional, autocratic wannabe. And the terrifying thing is, when you look at the 40,000 votes over three states, that separated a Biden victory from a loss. When you look at the quarter of a percent that separated Purdue winning in Georgia versus a runoff. When you look at the thinness, the thinness of the margin, the delusional guy is their front runner for president in 2024. And everybody should wake up to this reality. I'll tell you how he gets back on Twitter. It's the day he announces his candidacy. Yep. I'll tell you how he gets back on Facebook. It's the day he For announces sure. his candidacy. You know what his best strategy is to inoculate himself from criminal prosecution? It's to announce his candidacy. For office. And he is the leader, indisputably so. And these people genuflect to his every insanity. And that is the story and that is why we're not out of line to say who the hell is he saying that to and the deficiency yeah. in the facts presented to the american people about the danger because of the transactional relationships and the transactional access journalism is a real danger to the country we spoke to political strategist matthew dowd about the current nature of the republican party and how to confront it and we worry that they don't seem to get it just yet. What do you think it, it's going to take 
for the Democrats to understand what it takes to keep the House in 2022, because the wins are not necessarily in their favor traditionally. Um, but what do you think well, it's going to take for them to wake up and realize what's happening here and, and combat it? So I think more and more as the great thing about Marjorie Taylor Greene, I mean, the great thing about the, the despicable nature of Marjorie Taylor Greene is, is that the more she talks and the more she's not dealt with, it shows those Democrats that think there was some old normal to go back to. They they realize more and more that that's not the case. This is who the party is. And I think the Liz Cheney episode was another sort of factor in convincing them more of them, this is not what we need to do. Former commanding general, Europe and 7th Army, retired Lieutenant General Mark Hurtling had this to say. My favorite movie of all time is Saving Private Ryan. And, mm -hmm. and there's a great scene at the end of that movie where Tom Hanks pulls uh, Matt Damon into him close. And as Hanks is dying, Captain Miller is dying, he says, earn this earn yeah. this what we have given to save your life and and then it fast forwards to to old man private ryan mm -hmm. in the cemetery at normandy with his family and he turns to his his wife and says tell me i'm a good man mm -hmm. tell me i've deserved what they did for me and that's what i think we need to go back to as a nation is earning the things that so many people have sacrificed for and it's unfortunately not what we're seeing today. We spoke with former Navy SEAL and president of Veterans for Responsible Leadership, Dan Barkoff, about the radicalization occurring within the military and law enforcement. In your experience, because you've served and you've served at an elite level, um, wh what do you think is the predicate for this extremism, this radicalism that we're seeing, um, this radicalization actually that we're seeing in the military and law enforcement, frankly. This is something that seems to be trending over the last few years. What, what do you think it is? No, it's a, it's a great question. So, you know, when you think about someone who served in the military, right? Like when do they decide they're gonna join, you know, the, the QAnon militia and kidnap a governor, right? So, you know, there's three possibilities. Right. One, and this, we know this exists, and this was a problem back in kind of the 90s. Um, there are white supremacist organizations that deliberately send members to go to the recruiting station and join up. Okay, that's a tiny minority. Some folks are getting radicalized in the military. And, you know, because of the UCMJ, because of the military, um, the way it, it operates, you know, the military needs to deal with that. But we've actually at VFRL have partnered with a couple of academics who've been studying this issue, uh, University of Maryland and University of Southern California. And uh, the vast majority of these folks who are, who are taking this hard, hard right turn, it occurs when they get out. So they get out of the military, they go home, and then that's where they decide, you know, and, and that's the part, you know, we don't know, right? Like, did, is it a buddy who says, Let's go shoot guns in the woods and, you know, check out the, the Turner Diaries or whatever, you know, but, but that's where the mo most people, it's when they go home and they link up with these folks. Author and democracy expert David Farris came onto the show to discuss how it doesn't take tanks and guns to overthrow a democracy. American democracy is not healthy right now, you know, and the, the Lafayette Square photo op where they forcibly cleared out protesters so he could you know, incompetently pretend to be religious was just you know, just a one symptom of a, of a larger disease here, which is that the, the Republican Party is having some sort of shared hallucination. Um, and the shared hallucination is about uh, election fraud, election integrity, right? Like big city Democrats are, are sort of magically producing hundreds of thousands of votes that, that, that weren't there. Uh, President Trump and, and former President Trump and in, in, in a year ago was already sort of telegraphing this plot. You know, um, he was telling us what he was going to do. He said, I, I'm not going to respect the election results. Um, there was already these rumors about how they were going to lean on Republican state legislatures to uh, to send alternate slates of electors to D.C. to be counted. Um, and when, when the stuff first started bubbling out, I thought, well, they can't do this, you know, um, and, and indeed they couldn't. Right. But like the, what they're doing right now is they are laying the groundwork um, for a better version of their 2020 uh, big lie election theft plot. Um, they're putting it into motion for next year. They're putting it into motion for 2024. They want to empower uh, red state legislatures and red state uh, secretaries of state and red state governors 
to overturn election results, to, to fire local election officials, uh, just sort of all sorts of malevolent stuff coming at us, all because the president, the former president of the United States um, has sort of hoodwinked his entire uh, cult into believing this, this, this dreadful lie. Um, and it, I think American democracy was already in trouble. That's why I wrote the book in 2018. Um, but he made it so much worse. Um, and we're in so, so much more danger than we were uh, even a few years ago um, that I, I just can't bring myself to do anything but run around kind of sounding the alarm. You know, <laughs> you know the, the dark beauty of, of this kind of facade democracy, what we call competitive authoritarianism in political science, um, is that it gives enough people in the system, enough people who are voting, confidence that they are taking part in a legitimate system to sort of ward off um, the mass discontent and the mass unrest that might lead to some kind of regime change. Um, and so, yeah, it's not going to look like Iraq. Um, it's not, it's not going to be tanks on the street. Trump's not going to ride down Pennsylvania Avenue, uh, in a, you know, in a hat and, uh, be reinstalled by the Supreme Court, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> uh, just unbelievable, these people. Um, but, uh, but what it, what it will look like, um, is, is a country where you, you can't change the leadership, you know, um, that, that you can do, you can win more votes, um, in all kinds of different places. Um, but, but ultimately you won't win those elections. And that is, uh, that is a system that will turn a lot of people off from participating in politics because they, they aren't going to believe that it's real. Um, the people that are participating in politics will be bought off or co-opted in some way. Um, and the scariest part about this, I think when people think, uh, about a coup, um, mm -hmm. they think of the big dramatic event, right? They think they're going to wake up the next day and be like, time to charge into the streets, right? Like, uh, we got to save our country. But this kind of this kind of competitive authoritarianism uh, is is not going to work like that. Um, if they steal the twenty twenty four election, or if they win the twenty twenty four election on their own terms, on a you know a gerrymandered house, a malapportioned sure. senate, a electoral college misfire, right, um, which is also a form of competitive authoritarianism, um, people are going to wake up the next day and they're going to go to work. Yeah, they're going to take care of the kids. Uh, they're not going to take to the streets um, in, a, in, in a subtle a democratic backsliding is that, and that they know that that's what they want. The house passed HR one, the for the people act. Um, you know, it's, it's not a perfect bill. There's some things in there that we can all disagree about. Right. Um, but fundamentally that bill is meant to shore up American democracy against the various assaults that are coming at it. Um, it is meant to prevent Republicans from drawing gerrymandered maps where they pick their own voters, um, and, and entrench their power for, for a decade or longer as they have done in Wisconsin, North Carolina, Michigan, Pennsylvania, um, none of these states, which are in comparative perspective, these are not democracies anymore, right? These are places where um, there are facade elections for the state legislature. Um, the party with more votes cannot actually take power. Um, and that means that the people themselves don't have control of the public agenda. That's like a basic uh, sort of definition of democracy. Right. And so what we're seeing right now is the Wisconsinification of American politics. They wanna do what they did in Wisconsin. They wanna do it to all of us. We were also joined by political scientist and professor of government at Harvard, Stephen Levitsky. He's also the author of How Democracies Die. Stephen stopped by The Breakdown to discuss how we can work together to keep our democracy alive. You said something that um, was very poignant. You, you made the point that democracy has never been in more peril than it is today, even more so than when you wrote the book in 2018. Why? Yeah, well, I should say, um, I think our democracy was in more peril at the time of the Civil War and the failure of Reconstruction. So in our, in our lifetimes, it certainly has not been in more peril. And it's in certainly in more peril than when we wrote the book. I think the biggest difference is that when we wrote the book, a lot of our focus was on Trump. We, we were very critical of the Republican Party for enabling Trump, for not standing up and, and distancing themselves from Trump. Um, but we did not view the Republican Party in 2016 as an anti-democratic force. And now we've come to believe that the Republican, the entire party is, is essentially an authoritarian party. When, when, a, when a party grows so extremist that it sees a victory by the other side, by their rivals, as an existential threat, as something that they can't live with, something that's beyond the pale, then they, they adopt a win at any cost mentality. They adopt a, a by any means necessary um, mentality. What, what, it, it's not every day that Republicans are talking about coups in Myanmar, but um, the, the message is very clear. 
that if it takes authoritarianism to preserve their the, the way they conceive of 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 uh, of American identity or American way of life or community, so be it. The the two month period in between the election and and January, when Donald Trump tried for two months openly, openly to overturn the election. Republicans learned that not only would they not pay a price for trying to overturn an election, but they would be rewarded by their base for doing so. That lesson is still, the, the, the consequences of that lesson are to be played out in the three years to come. And we spoke to former federal prosecutor Glenn Kirshner about the odds Trump will actually pay a price for inciting the insurrection. At the end of the day, Donald Trump is a federal problem. He has violated so For many sure. of the laws of our nation. He has victimized the American people. He needs to be indicted federally. The top five reasons why Don McGahn's testimony was important. I could use a Paul Schaefer drum roll. So not, <laughs> number five, we'll work our way back, um, is the substance of his testimony. Because he said in substance, Donald Trump committed obstruction of justice. By all of the facts and information he relayed, that is the conclusion. Two, it's no longer hearsay. Because what we had in the Mueller report was Don McGahn told Bob Mueller that Donald Trump said that all of that melts away because now it's sworn testimony of a firsthand account of Donald Trump's obstruction of justice that can be used in court in all sorts of ways. Um, and it would take a long time to go through the legal niceties of the different ways we can use sworn transcripts in an official proceeding, but they are enormously beneficial to a prosecution in a way the Mueller report was not, okay? Number three, I think you just alluded to it, Tara, Don McGahn is, is a truth teller. I think by all accounts, think what you will about his politics and his positions, he's a truth teller. He is a reliable witness. That hurts Donald Trump. Four, and I love this one, Bill Barr can't spin this testimony. That's right. The way he spun the Mueller report and uh -huh. one of my favorite judges, Judge Walton, called him out on it said oh, Bill yeah. Barr spun the Mueller report, mischaracterized the Mueller report, and Bill Barr lacks credibility. I'll tell you, as a federal prosecutor, I'd crawl under a rock and die if a federal <laughs> judge said that about me. Bill Barr wears about the attorney general. I know. Unbelievable. And the number one reason, the number one reason that Don McGahn's testimony was hugely consequential is because now Congress can use it to make a criminal referral of Donald Trump for obstructing justice directly to the Department of Justice. And, and guess what? The White House is taken out of the mix because like you, Rick, I love and I respect the separation between the executive branch and the Department of Justice. It's what makes both of those, those agencies work the way they're supposed to. Donald Trump, right. I'm trying to find a nice word, stomped all over that separation and he did it in the worst and most yeah. nefarious ways by by protecting and rewarding his criminal associates like stone and bannon and manafort and trying to punish his enemies like um uh, mccabe who fortunately my friend and former u.s attorney jesse lou would not cave i'm i'm extrapolating based on what we know from the public reporting would not mm -hmm. cave and indict or ask a grand jury to indict McCabe. So now the Biden White House can be out of the mix and Congress can take the testimony of Don McGahn and they will get the testimony of others, package it up in a beautiful criminal referral and drop it right on Merrick Garland's desk. That will bring it to a head. Professor Larry Sabato gave us a look into his crystal ball. He's the director of the UVA Center for Politics and he stopped by to discuss What's next for America? When you look at this, this latest BS that they're trying to put out there, that's the FBI now that, that you know, is, is behind this. It's a false flag operation. And, and these Republicans that are pushing this and explain to the American people why this is so dangerous for our democracy. Democracies only function well when the truth 
is acknowledged by at least most of the participants. You're always going to have people presenting different ideological perspectives, personal perspectives. That's a good thing. You want to bring people together in that way, uh, maybe by airing their differences. But when you have a sizable segment, uh, nearly a majority of the Congress, for example, and 74 million people who voted for Donald Trump in 2020, despite four full years of his outrages, that's that's what really worries me. But getting back to uh, Trump and his big lie followed by January 6th. When, when you have a large segment of your governing population, Congress, state legislatures, governors, and so on, either really believing in a lie or pretending to believe in a lie, and a big one it is, we've never had a coup attempt like January 6th since the Civil War. I count the assassination of Lincoln uh, as a coup attempt since they also tried to kill the uh, vice president and the secretary of state. That's how long it's been since there has been any kind of coup attempt. And this was a serious coup attempt. And those who are trying to blow it off and say it didn't matter are actually doing this republic great harm. You've said that Trump created the big lie because he was embarrassed. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Well, the, the uh, giveaway was in 2016. He created the big lie ahead of the election he won. He won in the Electoral College, not the popular vote. But right. he believed right up until the end, and no one will ever convince me otherwise, that he was going to lose. And he wanted to make sure he had a ready-made excuse that his followers would believe because, as he said himself, he could go down to Fifth Avenue and, and kill somebody, and they'd all applaud. Uh, so he had to have an excuse for them. And the excuse was millions of illegal immigrants had flooded the polls and voted. Uh, voter fraud here, voter fraud there. And then when he won, he had to say, well, it was it was there. I actually won in a landslide. <laughs> Why well, I, I carried, you know, 50, 60 percent of the popular vote. So it started in 2016. He had already built, if I can use the word credibility for this incredible claim with his followers prior to 2020. Now, I think in 2020, he thought he was going to win in the end. That, that the same thing would happen and the polls were wrong and they were wrong in some cases. Again, uh, he thought he was going to win, but he wanted it there uh, in case he needed it. And because of the pandemic, it turned out he really did need it. But the only people who believe it are the people who are in cult 45. Uh, the problem for our country is there are millions and millions and millions of people who need deprogramming. Every single member of Congress in the House and the Senate who voted to overturn the election based on nothing, uh, who uh, refused to give a gold medal to the officers who protected them, and on and on, they all need to be punished in one way or another. We also discussed foreign policy and Putin's political game with Sarah Kenzier, author of Hiding in Plain Sight and co-host of the podcast, Gaslit Nation. I do wish that more attention had been paid by Biden and his team uh, to the list of sanctioned uh, oligarchs that Alexei Navalny, the Russian dissident, put forward. Um, because I think the, mm -hmm. that's the frontiers of our new warfare, are these oligarchs uh, who have interfered in our affairs and are committing grotesque human rights violations and propping up Putin's Kremlin and and cyber warfare, and then of course everything they've done to the United States, uh, you know, with the uh, abetting of the Trump administration over the last four years. I mean, there's my God, I'd be here for you know several days. But <laughs> list all of them, you know what they are. Right. Um, that also makes for very difficult discussion, and it was really to me like the elephant in the room. Like, how do you not talk about this? But given that, you know, our news media, a lot of our elected officials just kind of don't want to talk about it. They want to, quote, move forward. I, I don't think that's going to work out. You know, you got to right. take this on. You need accountability. You need transparency. Former FBI agent and Russian disinformation expert Clint Watts stopped by to discuss the high stakes of the GOP's war on truth. Behind the scenes, we know there was a huge organization doing that. And the organization's right. stated mission was to overthrow the U.S. government or right. stop democratic processes. The definition of terrorism is the use of violence or the threat of violence for political change or social or political change. 
That's what happened. If there had been someone with an Osama bin Laden logo on their Facebook page say, hey, let's go to the Capitol and break into it, they would immediately get a visit from the FBI because there is a case open that's called Al-Qaeda-inspired terrorism. Uh, FBI agents are organized around it. There's international terrorist group, uh, terrorist organizations that analyze it and put all these pieces together. They have social media. They're up and looking for that. Um, if someone had paid for that person to go to the Capitol, they would be in violation, would be material support to terrorism. So all of this just happened super quick, right? And we developed these systems out after 9-11. No domestic terrorism you know, provision, no organizational structure, then it ends up every individual agent around the country um, pursuing each of these individuals as loan cases, and they have to wait for an overt act that crosses the threshold of free speech to violence, which means all the way up until they step across the threshold of the Capitol, they can probably say, oh, this is my free speech. I'm just here because I'm really upset. And I think the election was rigged. Um, but behind the scenes, we know there was a huge organization doing that. And the organization's right. state admission was to overthrow the U.S. government or right. stop democratic processes. Democratic Texas State Representative Julie Johnson came by to give us an insider's look at what's going on in the Texas State House. Tell the audience a little bit more about what the Republicans tried to do that actually forced you guys to say enough is enough. We're walking out. Well, there were a lot of things that were going on. Uh, first of all, they filed a terrible bill that was just fraught with voter suppression and a design to really intimidate voters from coming to the polls. But what happened was we had the bill in the House and the House, we made a lot of amendments to the bill, which made it better. It was still a terrible bill, but we made it better. And then it went back to the Senate and they had the option to concur or make their own amendments. But what they did is they stripped every House amendment and then wrote an additional 20 pages of this bill with all new provisions that had never gone through committee, that had never been debated, that the public never ever had a right to comment on and weigh in on. And they did that within 24 hours of the deadline. We got the changes that they made. Now, remind you, it was a 20 page addition to the bill with a whole new set of provisions at 4.52 when the, the, the clock was to run at midnight with no opportunities to prepare. And it was unexcusable. They, they completely violated every rule of decorum, of procedure, of process that we have in the House just to steamroll us into one of the most horrendous voter suppression bills this country has ever seen. And we were just not going to have it. When we did it, there was, we were just felt like we were really fighting, you know, because oftentimes we just, we can have our words and this time our actions, we were actually able to put it all in motion and take a really hard stand and say, no, no more. We are not going to take it anymore. Enough is enough. We're going to do whatever it takes to stop this bill. And it was thrilling to be part of it. A man who needs no introduction. If you haven't watched our interview with former Trump attorney Michael Cohen, here's your chance to watch some highlights. We covered it all. Trump's life in Mar-a-Lago, his favorite children, and we even heard some of Michael Cohen's interesting nicknames for his former boss. Donald never wanted to be president of the United States. I want to be very clear. When we started the campaign in 2015, this was supposed to be the greatest infomercial in the history of politics. It was really all about rebuilding the brand, getting out there, having fun, and you know, getting the name out there to do more deals. As he continued to rise in the polls, then he decided that you know, he was going to take it a little more serious, but never thinking that he was going to beat Hillary Clinton and the Clinton machine. So you could imagine to his surprise when he ultimately became president and won on election night. So that being the case, you have to think about what did Donald really want? He didn't want to be president. He wanted to be a dictator. He wanted to be an autocrat. He wanted to be a monarch like Mohammed bin Salman, like Putin, like Kim Jong-un or Erdogan. That's who Donald Trump wanted to be. And rest assured, had he won, had he won the, um, the election, the re-election, he would be right now looking to figure out how to be president again for another four years and to shred our democracy 
in the belief that he could stay on for good. Mr. Trump called me a rat for choosing to tell the truth, much like a mobster would do when one of his men decides to cooperate with the government. It was relevant to their investigation. Everything that I told the SDNY was truthful, though they didn't believe that I told them everything. On top of that, everything that I told the House Oversight, the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, the House Select Committee on Intelligence, the Judiciary, the Attorney General, the District Attorney, every single one of them will acknowledge that every single thing that I told them was true. And I knew that people would ask that type of question. I knew that the Republicans would not do their job, which is to represent their, pe their constituents, but to represent their constituents on behalf of America. So I knew what they were going to do, which was to attack my character. How did I know? Because I wrote the fucking playbook. You know, Michael, we're seeing in the New York Times tonight that there are, there are leaks now that Weisselberg may be indicted soon. Because apparently he wanted to be the tough guy and, and pretend he wasn't going to break and call their bluff. And apparently they're not going to deal with it. How do you think a guy of his age is going to handle, you know, going down to the Metropolitan Correction Facility to get booked or going out to Rikers for a little while? I, I got to imagine it's going to be a fairly hard ride for Alan Weisselberg. Well, let me let me kind of answer it in two words. Not well. He knows that he's despised. And that's one of the reasons why he walks around Mar-a-Lago, right, which is sort of um, an insane asylum for incredibly wealthy sycophants that want to sit there and pat the fat ass of Donald <laughs> right. Trump. Why? I have no idea. Some of these people are so rich that they could burn Donald's money and still be mega billionaires. And why yeah. they want to sit there and placate this dumb fuck. I got I have no idea because they don't need him. You know, in Yiddish, they say a lachem cup, right? A hole in his head. That's what these yep. people it's like a lachem cup. They don't need him at all. He offers nothing to them other than hanging out with a guy who, again, is a fucking racist. And he's sexist and he's everything right. else that I said. He's xenophobic and homophobic and Islamophobic and anti-Semitic. He's all of these things. So why in the world would you possibly want to sit there, associate yourself? Why would you want to pay 250, 300,000 for a bond so that you could sit there and when Donald walks in, people stand up? You saw this up close and personal. You had a series of incredibly painful personal revelations about who he was because he turned his back on you. He pissed on you when you, you know, when you had done everything in your power to help him. My question is this, to save his own ass, which one of his children goes down first? I think Ivanka's Don last, Jr. but it's yeah. Don, Don Jr. Jr. He dislikes yep. his Eric, own son is what and I then, And then Ivanka, yeah. but yes, it's Don, Eric, then Ivanka. Take the capital, I'll meet you there. Isn't that what he said? Right. Mm -hmm. He knew he wasn't yep. going to go there because it's dangerous. In all fairness, Donald Trump's a pussy. All right. Donald Trump never in his <laughs> life had a fight. We used to talk about stuff like that all the time because I used to fight when I was a kid all the way through God knows when. Right. I mean, it, it was just totally different personalities. He never had a fight in his life. So when he now sees these this this um, paramilitary army with MAGA written flags, 2020 Trump with the make America great again hats going in the shirts and the whole nine yards all doing this for Donald Trump. He was excited from it. This, this was like, this was better for him than sex. You know, you have to understand there's a level of arrogance. It's not just arrogance. It's also ignorance that exists at the Trump organization where people truly believe like Donald that you're untouchable. He's the Teflon Don. And therefore, since he's the Teflon Don, he's going to figure out how to save me. Well, no, Donald's not going to save you, you dumbass. All right. Donald's going to fucking throw you <laughs> under the proverbial bus. And when you get run over by the tire, he's going to jump into the, you know, to the driver's seat and he's going to run over you again to make sure that you're gone. That's just Donald. If I can give anybody advice that's still there or still aff affiliated to Donald in any way, fucking run they are so entrenched right. into this cult of trump it's no different than jim jones and the jonestown massacre sure. if donald trump told them to drink the trump aid they would drink the trump aid and it really it took i swear it took for me to get kicked to the curb and incarcerated in order to get right. me out of the cult of trump you had the opportunity with no consequences 
whatsoever. Donald was in front of you. What would you say to him? Wow, that's um, that's a great question. First of all, it would probably start off with "fuck you." All right, I gave you <laughs> everything. I protected you. I protected your wife. I protected your kids. I protected your company. The fact that you threw me under the bus the way that you did, right, to me is inexcusable. But at the same time, at the same time, you may find this interesting. At the same time, I would actually say thank you. I would, I would thank him for throwing me under the bus because it was probably the only way that I would be able to extricate myself from the cult of Donald Trump. It's been an incredibly fast few months here on The Breakdown, and you are the best audience we could have ever hoped for. In the coming months, we'll continue to break down all the headlines with even more experts to give you an insider's glimpse into this crazy political world. And together, with your help, we'll never give up this fight for our democracy. Thanks for watching. We'll see you every Tuesday and Thursday night at 8 p.m. Eastern on The Breakdown. The alternate domination of one faction over another is itself a frightful despotism. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. America will never be destroyed from the outside. If we falter, it will be because we destroyed ourselves. It is of little use for us to pay lip loyalty to the mighty men of the past, unless we sincerely endeavor to apply to the problems of the present precisely the qualities which in other crises enabled the men of that day to meet those crises. Four of America's greatest presidents are carved into the living rock of South Dakota's Black Hills. They are a memorial to those who served with honor, led with courage, and took this great nation into the future. Their words, deeds, and legacies will survive time immemorial. America's worst president will neither be remembered nor revered. The Lincoln Project is responsible for the content of this advertising. America is the only country founded on an idea. The radical idea that citizens could govern themselves. It was called the American Experiment because there was no reason to believe it would work. A republic, if you can keep it. Every generation has been called to defend and renew the promise of America. For some it was on the battlefield. For others it was on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Now, the battle has come to the steps of the capital itself. Democracy is under assault like no time since 1860. We have a choice. Look away or stand up and fight. It's not about conservative or liberal. It's about freedom versus autocracy. We didn't choose this moment, but history has chosen us. Which side are you on? The Lincoln Project is responsible for the content of this advertising. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation, or any nation so conceived and so dedicated, can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this, but in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here, have consecrated it, far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, 
that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. The Lincoln Project is responsible for the content of this advertising. Democracy has to be the central unifying principle here. It's very healthy to have debates about lots of different policies, but we shouldn't be fighting over democracy itself. And to me, that's what's changed in the last decade compared to decades before this. It's fine to disagree on issues. Not even everyone has to like Joe Biden. But we need a broad consensus in favor of democracy in this country. And that's something that could unite AOC and Liz Cheney.